Thank you very much for being with us. I'm very happy to be with you. So one of the points that you make in Whistle Stop is that things aren't necessarily better or worse in the past than they are today. Does that thesis still hold as you sit here in the summer of 2017? Well, it's a, it's a great question because the past, it's all been figured out and, and the wrinkles are removed and you know what led to what and things have been resolved. We're in a time of unresolution at the moment. Um, the President Trump has come to Washington with a revolutionary design for rewiring uh, Washington. And that's true both in the structure of the way the city works and in its policies. I mean, people right now feel anxious. Uh, Democrats certainly do. Some Republicans do. But we're nowhere near say 1968, where you had two major assassinations, a war going on overseas, riots in the major big cities. The entire American structure seemed up for grabs. Um, it was a less partisan time then than now, um, and yet it was much worse in terms of just those shocking moments. So um, that to me is one of the benefits of both studying history and writing about it, is that um, whatever we may be feeling in the present moment, there are always other moments to give you the kind of context and a little bit of um, a little bit of a breath um, so that we don't overanalyze what's happening in the moment and miss the fact that you know there are these patterns given your reading of history what is the one essential dimension of democracy that is most important and yet most under threat right now i think the well one that i'm focused on at the moment which may be um, is this idea of motive questioning on either side, which is that it was in the past the case that people were generally engaged in a common pursuit, which was to do the best things for the people in the name of the people who had elected you. Obviously in private dealings, there were people who would question the motives of their opposition, but it was not the starting point of, of affairs. You did not immediately begin with a questioning of the motives of your, of your opponent or of the press that you gave them, Ronald Reagan used to say about liberals, it's not that we don't like them, it's just that their ideas are wrong. Uh, that's fine, ideas are wrong. We're gonna have a battle of ideas. That battle can't take place if everybody not only is questioning the motives, but has the most corrosive view of the motives of the other person. So that makes it hard to make legislation. It makes it hard to read something in the paper and take the facts in or take the reporting in, in the spirit of the generous spirit that we would expect people to have when they in interact with each other. And as a result of corroding the political space, it also corrodes the way in which we deal with each other. I mean, that's the worry, is that what we see in our public life then, uh, if we don't have mediating institutions, if we're not going to mass, if we're not you know, living by some kind of code, the code that gets passed on through osmosis is one of conflict and motive questioning and not giving the other person the benefit of the doubt and just getting rid of the fellow feeling that should be a part of a, of a, uh, of a community, whether it's a small community or the community of America. Um, so that connection with a kind of common purpose, no matter what party you're from, um, seems to be in real threat. And, and the way you would rescue from that is for a public official to come out and be a model or for some leader in American life to be a model for how you behave, um, for how you treat your opponent or how you take complicated issues and talk about them. But in the way that politics is now talked about in either um, the news cycle or in social media, it, it, um, it, it squeezes those people out. The loudest, meanest voices are elevated and the voices of restraint are marginalized or they're seen as naive or they go off and they do something else. They absent themselves from politics entirely and go work on something else because they have it, it's uh, more rewarding and one of the ways that you keep yourself balanced uh, you've talked about this publicly is your faith I read somewhere that you go to the 515 vigil mass at uh, Holy Trinity in Georgetown I do although then now Holy Trinity um, thank goodness there's a 115 on Sunday and a 530 on Sunday so they're really it's available to me uh, at all at all different times so how is that weekly worship part of your preparation for what you do on Sunday morning? Well, I go to the church I went to when I was a, a, a kid growing up. So for me, that's the first thing. There is just purely that experiential thing. But also um, Mass, um, for me, is a, um, a specific place. And, I, and since I go with my family, too, I start to see it through their eyes, my children in particular. It's a, a place to be contemplative. It's a place to put things back in the right perspective personally, but also politically. Um, it's a place to stay in touch with that community 
um, and the, the biggest, largest community, the, not just Washington, D.C., not just the country, but, um, but mankind. And that is a wonderful balance to what, uh, to what we see basically every day. Um, and if you think perhaps the biggest lesson is to you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you or to not judge, um, those are pretty good things to remember in Washington. That doesn't mean you're not skeptical, obviously, but it, it means that your first instinct is not to immediately judge the person and then go from there, which is a, what, as a journalist is what you're not supposed to do. As a journalist, it's a clean slate, and then you build based on what you've learned. Um, and so uh, that crust of cynicism that builds up over time, um, you can break that away quite easily by not only remembering the lessons uh, of Jesus, but also the, you know, the primary lesson about our own failings. And if you're really aware of your own failings um, and your own sins, then that makes it pretty easy to not, or should, <laughs> uh, not, not immediately judge people um, without you know, having, uh, having done your homework and your reporting. That's really an extraordinary point of co continuity in your life, uh, to belong to the same worship community that you belonged to as a kid. You, you've actually talked about your mother, uh, and your relationship with your mother, a complicated relationship, but you credit her and your father with giving you this gift of faith. What was it that they gave you that made the difference? It's a great question. Well, so um, my mother, uh, I, she growing up went to mass every day with her, with her mother, and then she went to Clark College and studied with the nuns for a couple of years. So it was knit into her life, and it was not just on Sundays, um, which has also been very important to me and just the, some of the reading I do. And, um, and in this last campaign, um, when you can't make it to, to mass if you're traveling on Sunday or... Um, mm -hmm. So I think it was the continuity in the day-to-day -day that, um, that was important. Um, and I think also, again, the ritual of it. I mean, um, it's extraordinary that our children uh, will go to Mass with us on, on Sunday because they're teenagers and they want to be doing other things. <laughs> and, um, and yet, because I think it's a part of the tradition that we have in our family, it, um, even if they're not listening to the homily or the readings as much as they, uh, their father might want them to, they know it's important. And to be engaged as a family in something that's important has meaning and has value. And then it's there and you can pick it up as you get a little bit older, as I think I did. I mean, I, there were times um, where when I lived with my father, the Holy Trinity was just a few blocks away. Um, and then I went to mass by myself. I don't really remember why. And that's also to be in the presence of grace. Just there, that's all you got to do, you know. Um, uh, and of course, it's an act of worship. Whether you do it, whether you're, you're feeling per you know perfectly recollected or you're feeling uh, uh, moved, it doesn't matter. You're you are uh, participating in uh, ritual. Isn't the right maybe word that I mean? But you're participating in that thing that gives you meaning. And so um, they gave that to me. Um, in a way that, uh, I, that it's hard to articulate, but nevertheless is there, that pull is there. Um, and uh, even though my dad sometimes left right after communion, um, <laughs> we- uh, That's a big no-no. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, we now stay till, till the very end. So um, not all traditions were passed on. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting to me because the, the mass is, of course, it's a, it's a pull, it, it attracts you, but it's also a push in a sense. Right? The Mass is about mission. It's about coming together in this community and gathering the spiritual resources that we need to then go out into the world and do what we need to do. Exactly, and to do it mindful of the lessons you picked up on Sunday or of the mission, I mean right. the general mission, which is um, uh, articulated so nicely in the Gospels. Um, and that is um, making it more a permanent part. This is um, not something I've quite pulled the kids into yet, but um, my wife, who's not a Catholic, is nevertheless um, uh, teaches Sunday school and is, um, uh, is also a person of faith. And so the idea of it being a part of your daily uh, regimen, um, the daily part of your mindset, um, is very helpful. And Mass, kind of, if you haven't been doing your readings or you're whatever, distracted, it just kind of 
reminds you of that mission of not that you're not just that you're supposed to go there, but you're supposed to go forth from there. And it's really necessary. I found it in this, in campaigns in general, because they're quite um, destabilizing in terms of your, just your life. One of the very stabilizing things about this job, and in addition to the many wonderful things about it, is I always have to be in Washington on Sunday. So even though I'm missing right. um, uh, the normal mass I would go to, I am at least in town. I'm not, you know, I used to be on the road quite a lot on Sundays, and so you, you know, you try and find a church if you can, or you're on the plane or something, and that can be quite destabilizing. Um, and as you fall out of those routines, you can kind of, you know, it just, it, you miss it. Even, uh, even if it's not in some grand way, kind of, you, know, you do miss it. You're obviously a journalist that feels comfortable talking about his faith in a public space. And not every journalist would do that. Uh, how do people react to that? Well, there are a lot, there are a lot of journalists who are people of faith. Uh, one of the things I am, that I worry about is, um, is talking about faith in a way that would, add, I mean, obviously there's, you know, one is mindful of the lesson of the hypocrites, right? right? Um, and so for me, it's the most important part of faith continues to come back to the question of pride um, and humility. And so that's tricky because you can't, there are a lot of people who are publicly pious uh, and they, uh, that's not a judgment. It's just something that I want to avoid because for me, my faith reminds me of how, um, uh, how far short of, of a person who might have, uh, um, you know, a real reason to be publicly pious. So it's very, it's quite com complicated. Um, but on the other hand, I have uh, friends in journalism and other public people who are people of faith and whose um, ability to talk about faith publicly, but also in private conversation is a real model and is a real, um, is something really to behold um, and, uh, and, qu and quite affirming because they found a way um, to have it be a part of their life, and so you don't feel like you're over here in some a strange place, given the community that, that, that we're in. But there are, lots of, um, there are lots of people in faith in journalism, although I think probably some people out in the, in the country might think maybe that's not the case. Did you get a chance to see Pope Francis when he was here in Washington? No, no, I didn't. I, um, I did interview Speaker Boehner um, afterwards because this was the fulfillment of a many, many, many years long effort by Speaker Boehner to get um, the Holy Father to come to Congress. And so he was here and I asked, and this then, and then he resigned ap right after that. And I said, after uh, meeting the Pope, did you feel as though, and I did a short and probably not very good ex explanation of the Holy Spirit, but I said, were you moved by the Holy Spirit to then decide it was time to go. And he sort of mumbled through something. And then he called me about a week later. Um, and he said, you know, after you asked me that question, I thought about it and I thought about it. And he said, I, I think it was, that was the case. So for him, the, 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 visit, the visit was a real uh, turning point. Um, and uh, it was really, it was fascinating. He was, when he called, he was, um, he was really uh, enthusiastic about explaining how this had sort of come to him. Um, and so uh, that was a neat, uh, that, was, that, was a, that was very early um, uh, in uh, my time here. So that was a, an interesting um, way to start uh, having that kind of conversation, which isn't usually what we talk about at sure. the table. Thank you. Thank you.